Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Dart Beginners tutorial series. Today we're going to continue our exploration of classes in Dart. We'll be talking about things like final, static, we'll talk about methods, and we'll take a brief look at inheritance. Just to kind of remind you guys where we are, we are building a class for complex numbers, that is numbers that follow this format, where we have a real component, and then we have an imaginary component, which is multiplied by i, where i squared equals negative 1, or the square root of negative 1 equals i. And thus far, with our complex number class, we have the real and imaginary fields, both of which are private. Then we have getters and setters for these fields. We have three different constructors for this class. So we can create a complex object that has both the real and imaginary fields. And we can create complex objects where the real field is filled in with a number and the imaginary field is filled in with zero. And we can do the same with imaginary, where the imaginary field is filled in with a number and the real field is filled in with zero. We also went ahead and overrided the equals to operator and the toString method so that we could print out this object and see a nice representation of it and so that we could actually do an equals to operator against two complex objects. Now say we have two complex numbers. In this case, we have a complex number where we have three as the real and then negative four as the imaginary. And then we have another one where we have five as the real and then two as the imaginary. If we have these two complex numbers, let's imagine that we want to be able to just add them together. So I'm going to write out print and then I'll type in n1 plus n2 and you can see here that we do in fact get an error and that's because this class doesn't know how to react to this operator, the plus operator. We can of course add this functionality to our class and as we saw in the last video, we were able to use the operator keyword to do so. So if we want to add functionality for a symbol that is already a operator inside of Dart, we can use this operator keyword. And in this case, we're adding two complex numbers together. Addition for complex numbers is actually fairly simple. So we'll just return a new complex number where we just take the original complex number and we add its real value to the real value of the complex number that's being passed in here. And then we take the imaginary number component and we add it to the second complex numbers imaginary component as well. So now up in our main function, you can see that the error did in fact go away. And if we go ahead and run this application, you'll see that it will print out the sum of these two complex numbers. And we get eight minus two i. Now, of course, with our classes, we can create what are called methods that do not rely on operators. So in this case, I'm creating a method called multiply. So here we're saying, okay, we want to return a complex number and then we're going to take in a complex number C. And this is of course, strikingly similar to our operator method up here. Now to multiply two complex numbers together, we want to follow a formula called FOIL. For those of you who have ever taken algebra, you'll be familiar with this formula. We start with the first numbers in our complex number, so three and one. We multiply those two together and then we're going to add those to the inner numbers which are multiplied together. So negative two I times one, which would give us negative two I. Then we're going to add this to the outer numbers. So three times four I, which would give us 12 I. And then finally, we want to add the product of the last two numbers of our complex number. So we have negative two I times four I. And we would get something like this, where we get negative eight times i times i. And remember, i times i is negative one. So this negative eight would actually become a positive eight. So the resulting complex number would be three plus eight, which would give us 11 for the real value. And then 12i plus negative two, which would give us 10i for the imaginary value. Now we can apply this formula to our multiply method. So we'll create some variables here. We'll create one that is the first term. So three times one, which is just this real times C dot real. Then inner, which is the initial numbers, imaginary number times the second numbers, real number. So this dot imaginary times C dot real. Then outer will be 
this.real times c.imaginary. And then finally, we have last, where we're multiplying the two imaginary components together. And because these will always have i times i inside of them, we can just negate this entire thing. So it will always account for that multiplication of i times i and giving us negative one. So this dot imaginary times c dot imaginary, and then we put a negative in front of that. Then for the actual return statement, we want to combine the first term and the last term to create our real number. So first cross last, and then our imaginary will be inner cross outer. Now to actually invoke this method, we need to grab one of our objects, and this object will be the object that we want to apply this multiplication to. So we're gonna say n1 dot, and then this will give us access to our multiply method, and then we need to pass in our other complex number, which in this case is n2. So we're taking n1, and m1 will be the this in this case, and then n2 will be the c parameter which is being passed into this method. Now I'll change the complex numbers to be the same as the ones that we had in our example so that we can actually check that we get 11 plus 10i, and then we can run our application. And of course we get 11 plus 10i. So both of these methods allow us to define behavior for our complex number. Essentially what we're doing here is creating an interface that the program can use to properly deal with the data that's stored inside of each of our complex objects. And so when you think of all of the different functions that you can create inside of a class, whether they be getters or setters, constructors, operator methods, or just normal methods, just think of them as ways that you can restrict and change the data that you're building inside of the class itself. As we showed in the last video, we can add underscores to the fields to make them private. We can do the same for our constructors and for all of our different methods. So for instance, if I wanna make the multiply method a private method that can only be accessed inside of this class, then I can just throw an underscore in front of it. And of course, as I mentioned before, we can still access it inside of main because we're inside of the same file as the class declaration. But if we were in a different file, then this would not work. You would mainly want to do this if you wanted to have some kind of behavior that you wanted to use internally inside of the class, but you didn't want the actual program to have access to this behavior directly. The same is also true for, say, the constructor. So say, for instance, we want to limit the creation of complex numbers to either calling the complex.real constructor or the complex.imaginary constructor. We could add a dot underscore to our main constructor. And then, of course, when we call it inside of this class, we have to add that period underscore to all the other places where we're calling it, and that includes, of course, these places too. And then if we were in another file, we couldn't directly call to this complex constructor. Instead, we would be forced to instantiate complex numbers using the named constructors that we created in the class. So in this case, we could use complex imaginary and complex real, but we couldn't directly just call a complex number. Again, there are various reasons why you would want this, and there are various niche examples why you would actually do something like this. Let's go ahead and now create a subtract method for our class, but this time we're going to create what's called a static method. So we preface this method with a keyword called static, and this method will take in two complex objects and then pass back a complex object. And like with addition for complex numbers, subtraction is fairly simple. We just subtract the real component and the imaginary components and then put them into their respective slots. Now when I come back up to the main function and I try to invoke this method, I can't do it by using one of our instantiated objects. 
So if I take N1 and I try to call to subtract, you can see here that it will say that the static method subtract can't be accessed through an instance. So instead, what I have to do is call to the actual class itself and then call the method. And as you can see here, it sort of looks like a named constructor in this way. So we're saying complex dot subtract, and then this takes in N1 and N2, and then it will subtract the two and give us back our resulting complex object. The main advantage of using this static keyword is that we can access this method without actually creating an object of type complex first. And this method is essentially just a function that we've kind of namespaced to the complex class. And you would refer to this method as either a static method or a class method, because rather than calling it on an object, you call it on the class itself. Now the static keyword can also be used on fields. So for instance, let's say I create a static number field called counter, and I set it equal to zero by default. Now when I go ahead and declare the field as static, what this essentially means is that any object that is created of complex type will have access to this field and the value inside of it. No matter how many complex numbers we actually create, the counter field will always be consistent across all of those different objects. We can also come down to the complex constructor and add a body and make it so that it just increments the counter by one every single time we instantiate a new object. And now, if I want to access the counter field, I can do it like I did with our class method by calling to the class itself and then calling the field counter. Now in our main function, we call to the complex constructor twice. However, when we actually add the two values together, we create a new complex value as well. So we call to it a third time. We do the same when we multiply, so that would make it four. And then also when we subtract. So the counter for the complex number by the end of this main function will be five. And as you can see here, we get all of our complex numbers and then we get the counter value, which is of course five. Now let's talk about the final keyword. So you can define fields as final fields. And as soon as I do this for both our real field and our imaginary field, you can see here that our setters now are throwing an error. And the error, for instance, for real says that it can't be used as a setter because the field itself is final. Now what the final modifier does to a field is it allows us to say that we can only define this field once, and then once we've defined the field, it can't be changed. So naturally these setters don't work because these setters allow us to mutate the values inside of these fields. We do not have a problem, however, setting these fields inside of our constructor because these fields have no values attached to them before the object is constructed. We do get an error, however, if we initialize the fields when we declare them. So if I initialize both of these as zero, you can see here that this call to in our constructor is actually throwing an error because they already have values inside of them. You also can assign to a final field that's already been initialized using a initializer list like this. So I can't just pass in a new set of numbers and then just pass them into the final field like that. And even though these constructors are not throwing an error, they will because they're calling to our main constructor here with our this keyword. Now let's say we want to extend our complex number object to cover what are called quaternions. I hope I'm saying that right, by the way. Quaternions can have multiple different imaginary values attached to the number. So in this case, we have the real value, u. Then we have our first imaginary number, which is v times i. And then we have our second imaginary number, which is x times j. In this case, both i and j are equivalent to the square root of negative one like with i above, except now we can have multiple different values. And this can continue on, so it can go i, j, k, and so on and so forth. 
Now I'm not going to get too deep into the actual mathematics part of this particular type of number. And in fact, I believe quaternions are actually supposed to have the K part and not just I and J. But for the sake of simplicity, we're just gonna worry about I and J. So let's go ahead and create a class for this type of number. And we'll use a keyword here called extends for it to essentially grab the behavior that we have with our complex class and add it to this class. Now notice that we have an error here with the actual class itself. And this is because this needs to have a constructor. So let's go ahead and fix it. So for our new class, we'll add a new field called J image, which will also be a number like our real and imaginary fields. And then the constructor will take in three values, the real field, the imaginary field, and then this J image field. Now notice because this extends our complex class and it inherits from the complex class, we don't actually have to specify that this has a real and imaginary value attached to it. Instead, when we call to the constructor, we pass in two new parameters and we can specify their types inside of the constructor itself. And we also want to, of course, put a value into J image. So we call this dot J image, but then we take the real and imaginary numbers and we pass them to this keyword super with real and imaginary inside of it. And this super constructor will then call to our complex objects constructor, and then it will create our object using that. So for instance, if I come up to main and I go ahead and create a new quaternion, and I put in one, two, and three for the values in the quaternion, when I print it out, what do you guys think will happen? Well, as you can see here, it actually calls to our complex two string method because that behavior is being added to this quaternion class. So in other words, we get all of the methods that are in our complex class and they get applied to this new class. And we can then go ahead and override these methods if we want to add more functionality for our new class. And actually, we can see what is added to this class by simply using a dot here. You can see we have access to the imaginary and real numbers. We have access to the hash code function. We have access to the getters and setters for imaginary and real. We have access to our J image number. We have access to the multiply method. And we also have access to a few other methods, including our two string method. Notice, however, we do not have access to the static method subtract, and that's because that method is attached to the complex class, and it isn't passed down in the inheritance. So our quintarian class doesn't have the subtract class method attached to it. We'll talk more about inheritance in some of the future videos, but for now, let's go ahead and override and implement a new two string method for our quintarian class. As you can see here, this is actually what the two string method currently looks like. It just calls super two string. In this case, super is the complex class. So it just calls directly to our complex two string method. Here's what our actual two string method can look like. So we can just say if the J image is greater than or equal to zero and the imaginary number is also greater than or equal to zero, then we'll pass back a string that says this real plus this dot imaginary i plus this dot j image j. Then if j image is positive and our imaginary number is negative, then we want to put a negative here and take the absolute value of our imaginary number. And then finally, if we do not meet either of these cases, that means that the imaginary field is negative and the J image field is negative. So we'll go ahead and put negatives here and here, and we'll call absolute value on both of these values. So now when I execute the application, you can see here, rather than just printing out one plus two I, it prints out one plus two I plus three J. And of course, I can put in negative numbers here as well. So I can put in one 
and then negative 2 for i, and it will then, of course, print out 1 minus 2i plus 3j. Now notice that I can still grab our quaternion, and I can still apply the operator addition to it. So I can take q, and I can add it to, say, n2. Of course, when we do add it, and then when we do print it out, it gives us a complex number rather than a quintillion, and that's because it doesn't really know what to do with that final field. Also, we can go ahead and take the quintillion class and put it into our subtract method as well, because quintillion is technically a complex number type. But again, as you can see here, the behavior is a little bit weird, so we'll get to plus zero i for our subtraction, and that's because it doesn't take into account the actual j field. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.